my dad told me when I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe 14. Because that year he had put a cap on my um, back to school shopping. <laughs> so like the my budget was a little low that year and I didn't like that. So I told him like, listen, whatever money you're saving for college, let's just put that into this year's budget of back to school shopping and I'll get a scholarship. We don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and his words to me was, AJ, if you're serious, he was very serious and just said, there's always someone better. So if you really think you're gonna get a scholarship, there better be no one that works harder. And I don't know, that just transformed my brain chemistry in some capacity mm. because it just, boom, from then on out was when my work ethic was born. And even when I would be in LSU, like laying down after a full days of work, even after extra hitting, I'm like, man, someone in California has two more hours than me. Gotta go back in cages, you know what I mean? Like it really just transformed everything. There's a million things you're doing right now, AJ, but I want to kind of, I'm really curious because we all know how good of a softball player you are. We see the diving plays, first ever gold glove. There's so many accolades. Softball on a professional level isn't getting the notoriety it should. It's starting to trend that way and get yeah. back to that direction. But the biggest question that I had was, it seemed like you've played a couple years professionally and then you got into a lot of stuff on TV, promoting baseball, promoting the game. Why did it stop the playing career to then go that? I know the injury, did the injury stop it? Or did you decide you felt like your calling was to then promote the game of softball? And that's just kind of what you felt that direction you wanted to go. There's essentially two leagues in women's softball, professional softball. And so there's Athletes Unlimited. They are essentially like a fantasy league type of a, a league where, you know, you can draft your, your team changes every week. And so you're there for about two months or three months. The girls, they have a league or they have um, a season that's two weeks and it's called like AUX. And so they'll have that a little bit prior to the start of the season, which started I think a couple of weeks ago. So probably the early, early August or end of July. And then that goes until I think probably the end of this month or early September. And so that's Athletes Unlimited. And that's the one that you get to see on TV. They have the most coverage. Um, they've been distributed now on ESPN and they, they do a, a lot better job of marketing and they're able to really, they've created a lot of brand partnerships and partnerships with different networks that allow the girls to be seen more. And for now, people would be like, oh, there is professional style. Because before when I would say, oh, I play pro ball, I was like, oh, there, that's a thing, right? And I feel like that's no longer the response, which I think is amazing. So I played in that league the first season of it. WPF is the other league. And so that is kind of the new... NPF, which was at one point the only softball league. So National Pro Fast Pitch was turned into Women's Professional Softball, WPF. And that is the league that doesn't get as much coverage because it doesn't have the distribution of like the ESPNs and the different things that Athletes Unlimited has been able to do. So it's just a little lesser known, right. the WPF, but there are options available for, for both because the Athletes Unlimited model may not be for everybody. Yeah. When do you find time to keep the swing right? To live? To log in? Yeah. And every time I turn I the TV on, I see you. Well, that's great. In a good way. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy about it. I'm very Love happy that about one. It. Yes. But I mean, literally, just whenever I have time, time. And, oh. you know, it's kind of, it is a little frustrating because, I mean, as athletes, right? We, and I'm someone that was always, I've known for my work ethic. And I think if you were to talk to Coach Trino, who's my, head coach at LSU, she would be the first to say, I don't know if I've ever had someone work harder than AJ. And so for me, someone that that's just kind of ingrained in me to not be able to just grind all the time, um, or I'm grinding, I'm splitting my time between, you know, different segues. It's, it is difficult. And um, it's hard because I'm not always with the team. So like I come in, <laughs> I've missed, I don't know, five games, and then I'm coming in for three, and then I miss another three. So it is, it is hard. You, I'm sure you, like being a teammate is, matters so much to you, being a culture person. Yeah. What's it like, how do you think that affects the, your teammates, you coming in every three games or not being yeah. there as much, or does it have any negative effects in your opinion? I don't know if it affected the girls as much. I do know that, you know I mean, camaraderie and, and being able to really grow and have those relationships with your team, uh, the chemistry, I think that that, I don't know if it suffered, but it definitely, I didn't feel like I was 
necessarily fully meshed in with everybody because I've just, you know, I miss so much of the time. But luckily the girls are amazing. And so it's, you know, I jump in, I don't feel like out of place or anything like that. But I think it's just who I am as a person. I just feel guilty because it's like, why? You know, I mean, I haven't been here. Or if I come in and I start a game, it's like, did I really deserve that? Because I haven't been, you know, with the team type thing. So, but I mean, my experience has been great. The coaches have been great. It just is... I think just personally, I'm like, yeah. ah, man, you know, it really is tough to split. But professional softball, we don't get paid. You know, we don't get paid enough to live. And so it's everyone understands. So I think that that's where, like, there's no hard feelings. It's never like, oh, man, why is AJ never here? Everybody gets it, right? Yeah. Because most of the girls are coaches when they're not playing. That's why the season's only in the summer, because most girls then go coach their college teams in the fall. And so it really is just kind of like a give take and we all are just rooting for each other. So you don't get paid at all? You get paid, but I mean, okay. we get paid Not enough a, to a make month, that. hardly yeah. a month. I wouldn't, it wouldn't pay a month's rent here in New York Yeah, and <laughs> for this season. Yeah, and I'm sure there's <laughs> a level of appreciation from your teammates as well because the level that you have gotten yourself to and you've earned this, your word carries weight now. The way you promote baseball and what you do for softball on the youth side, promoting the game with all the videos you do, all the the interest and the 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 want that you want to give back to the game and give back to the youth on the softball side. So in doing that with baseball now, what are some things you've learned with baseball in covering the game, promoting the game that you think you can then bring to the softball side to help that continue to grow? You know, in baseball, the conversation is always around how to really get kids, you know, back into really loving and being interested in the game. It's huge thing. And yeah, it's huge. And I mean, kids really run the <laughs> run everything yeah. and so i think that is a lot of that is the way that the marketing is trying to really to move within baseball and the conversations that are being had and being able to really show the authentic characters uh, characteristics of the players i think that that's important to go into softball and whenever i'm with the girls or whatever i'm doing personally i'd love to show that aspect of what i do on the field and then just also how i envision just life and you know I'm I feel like I'm someone that I love like motivational quotes and I really dive deep into the mentality of the game and so being able to share the things that I've learned um, I think that that's really important being able to show who you are because as we said we don't as I said we don't get that coverage so the only way for anyone to know about us is if we put it out really and so I think being able to bring that to the softball side and just kind of letting them know and I think even just being like leading by example seeing the different things that I'm doing I think has really showed a lot of the other women to do the same. And I think a lot of girls are doing a great job of it. In mm -hmm. a perfect world, if you had your way, where would you see professional softball for women in America in five years time? Man, I would see like a contract like Shohei. I would see, <laughs> yes. yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. In a perfect yeah, world. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what I that's yeah. what I would see for myself. Yeah. But um, you know, I honestly just to get to a place where women don't have to have two jobs, right? It can fully fund. You can be a professional athlete and that be your only job up until the point where you hang up your cleats, um, and you don't have to worry about. Well, I don't know if I'm gonna or myself, right? I can't go and do one thing or the other. Um, and I think that would be amazing for the girls to not have to worry or the season be longer than two months and there'd be a position where people are just as excited to watch college softball as you now see the world excited to watch. I mean, pro softball as you see the world wanting to watch college. College has grown exponentially over the past couple of years. And I think that's all due to the coverage. And so, you know, I would love more coverage for women softball, women in sports in general. I mean, you see what it's done for the WNBA and with what it's seen for college. And I think if we can have that same trajectory the same way women's basketball has I think it would be amazing even the choice to be out of the success that you've been able to now find since you've stopped uh, playing full-time I guess you'd say on the TV side at least if you were able to have a choice if there was a league that you could say I'm not ready to start that side of my career yet I actually want to go and, and pursue my sport I think that's so important for you to to raise that even though now you've been so successful I mean you are like Eric said you're literally everywhere right now yeah I can't open my phone without seeing AJ Andrews somewhere you know what? I actually event. love that lately everyone's I've so many people have called me Carmen San Diego within yeah, the last we're, we're in the world. like yeah and I actually yeah. never even heard of that yeah, yeah. Some of my yeah. age, but never heard of that until yeah. like about a month ago but about like five people have said it where in the world are you Carmen San Diego yeah. mm -hmm. so I gotta keep my I gotta keep <laughs> my gig up I don't know if you guys have seen I mean watch stopped and watched softball it is, I love it because it's so fast, Quick. it's so electric, yeah. the energy, the passion. Yes. Like, 
even a ground ball the shortstop like you never you, know yes. you never know yeah. they're run, hustling Might down run it the out. lines the college it's like, world series yeah. it's yeah. always you, like we talked about it always does great ratings yeah. everyone yeah, watches it, everyone locks so, it in for those so for those who are not familiar with watching the game of softball compared to baseball you, what would you tell someone who how would you sell softball how would you sell it sports science said it was harder <laughs> <laughs> that would be my, the first thing I would lead in with. Uh, but no, I think that to your point, it's just faster paced. And then, you know, you have women that slap, you have a triple, I was considered a triple threat. So I could slap, slap hit is when you run through and, you know, hit at the same time, but, and then also I could hit it over the fence. And as an outfielder, <laughs> love that. It, Thanks. It's a good tool. I think it needs everyone to know that too. Because people are like, oh, were you a slapper? I'm like, I was a hitter that slapped. Yes. <laughs> like I could slap the ball, but I could also hit it over the fence. So you had to play me normal, right? Yeah, Versus yeah. like a true slapper where you, you move up in the outfield. But in the outfield, whenever a slapper came up, I feel like we were always a little bit more on our toes, a little bit more not sure what to do and on top of the speed that they would have, but also the placement typically is a lot better. And then, but when someone's just, a power hitter. It's like, all right, you're either gonna hit it to me, or you're gonna hit it over my head, right? Like, we're I'm ready. It doesn't matter where I'm gonna go. But you have the slappers can go anywhere. It could bloop right in front of you. It could go over your head. It could be a line drive. It could tip off of the infielder's glove. There's just so many different outcomes. And you know, I think that the way that the game is, and to your point, people run everything out. It's just such a fast pace fun sport. Women are throwing. Anytime I say softball and they're not familiar, everyone goes, oh, this one. <laughs> that one, it's like, yes, women are throwing the ball 70 miles an hour, which, you know, in comparison to baseball, it's 90 plus. So it's it's a fun game to watch and it's always super competitive. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those videos too. where G G uh, uh, Jenny Finch pitching against like uh, yes. the pool? Yeah, Albert yeah. Pujols. Yeah. 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 Embarrassing them, basically. Yeah. Embarrassing yeah. Them. She was throwing those rise balls. Yeah. You couldn't do nothing with it. Yeah. It's now the guys that uh, throw the four seamer at the top of the zone. And yeah, they have the it looks like a ride. Right, that's, yeah. what, that's what that is, right? <laughs> was There's, Jenny Finch someone that you looked up to? She was someone that was always one of the legends. But I would say probably my the person that really inspired me was Natasha Watley. But it all comes down to representation. And for me, when I first started playing Little League, softball was honestly one of the last sports I picked up. I didn't start playing softball until I was 11, which is a lot later than what you yeah. see these kids doing yeah, now. Was, oh, my yeah, God. They're yeah. like Especially for hitting playing eight. You're playing hand travel hand ball at like five now. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's insane. And But for softball, I remember sitting at a – I'm from Florida. So sitting in a Beefo Brady's after one of my – Little League softball games and the World Series was on and it was UCLA versus Michigan. And so Natasha Watley played for UCLA. And to me, that was the first time I really connected that, oh, this is more than just me going down the street to my to Oldsmar Little League and, you know, just playing with my friends. Like I could be on TV. And it's because I recognize Natasha Watley is a black woman. And so to me, I saw myself in her. And um, you know, I think she's really someone that is the reason why I pursued softball out of the many sports that I was playing. I didn't see, it really is, just, you have to see it to believe it because I was a very good soccer player as well. I also played basketball and I think I would have done really well if I continued with that. But I connected because I had watched on TV for the first time someone that looked like me playing the game. And I don't know why I stopped playing soccer. I really think I could have gone far with that. But I think Natasha Watley was really the reason. Did you ever get to meet Natasha? I'm sure if oh, you, yeah, did, you guys have friends. a great relationship. You awesome. You know, when, you're, when your idols become, I mean, we played against each other. So it's like when your idols become your rivals type thing in, in pro ball. But I mean, even when I was playing against her, I'm like, oh my God, there's Natasha Watley. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, now she's someone that I, I talk to all the time and I see everywhere. And so she's been an inspiration, I think, for so many. And I think it's super cool that, in the flip side, so many girls say the same thing about me. And it's just like, you know, it's a continuation. And that's ultimately one of my goals. What did you learn from her that you are now passing on to the girls that do look up to you? Because, I mean, LSU is a huge market in itself. Yeah. Baton Rouge. I've gone down to a football game. It's insane. While I was at that football game, there was a... Which game did you go to? It was back in the day. I might be dating myself a little bit. It was Johnny Football. It was it was raining. I think it was... I was there when Johnny Football played. Really? Yeah. Texas A&M? Yeah. It's, How old are please you? Please don't... Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're like dating myself. <laughs> what? Like, it's like, I was there during okay, that time. I didn't think we were the yeah. same age. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now we're talking. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, there was a fall baseball game going on, and there was like four or 5,000 people at this baseball game. And... 
people before Bregman and now people younger than us, um, you know, Paul Skeens, what he's doing, not only in baseball, all the athletes from LSU. So did that help prepare you for some fame now and getting recognized and telling people they look up to you and seeing you on TV? Did all of that kind of play a factor? And what did you learn from Natasha? Well, I think that just like you never know who's watching, right? I mean, Natasha Wally's out there just playing and is just trying to be the best at her game, not realizing that there's a little girl in a Beefo Brady's whose dreams just got realized because she's watching her on TV. And so to me, it was like the power of a moment and the power of just your presence, right? And what I really thought too also when I got to LSU was – there's so many times when I'd be out on the field and after the games, we'd be signing autographs and the little girls would be like, oh, you're my favorite player. And I'm always, and so many times I've thought to myself and I was like, man, did I go, I went like one for four today. <laughs> Why am I for your favorite player? You know what I mean? Like, it's just all these things. And, but it comes down to, well, we have the same number or you were the same bow as me, you know what I mean? Or no, we play the same position. It's nothing more than just being there and being present and them being able to identify something, whether it is your number or you were the, your hair the same way or you play the same position. And it has nothing to do with how well you actually play, just that you're there. And I think that's really what I took from Natasha, being that me just looking up randomly, you know, when I'm 11 years old, how that sparked my the course of my life today, um, how me just being present and me just being there on the field or the, something that I say and always encouraging could spark a new dream in, in a young in a young athlete. So power presence. Where is the state of youth softball? Because there's so much we've learned about youth wow. baseball that surprised us. But where youth softball, where is the state of youth softball right now? I'm curious what you learned about youth baseball that surprised Oof, you. So much. There's, there's too much baseball happening right now, first of all. Too there's much, too, too much, much money being spent on baseball from, there's just, there's just travel ball is the main focus it feels like for everybody. Yes. Is that? And, and in that too much baseball, it's kind of individualized too much. There's maybe too much showcases. I don't think there's enough team aspect. I think every tournament, every showcase you go to now, they give you an individual rating, they give you a write-up on how you did, they rank the players, and there's not... When I was in high school, it was like summer ball was, yeah, we, move, we might go to a showcase or two, we're going to play on tournaments, but it's all about winning your state championship and get ready for that. And playing with the same guys all the way up. You get to, yeah, you get to learn play and learn aspect. and team. And now yeah. I think there's kids flying in and out of, you know, from California to play this tournament, they're going to this yeah. team to play this tournament. So I think it's become a little more individualized. I'd like to see it kind of team up a little bit Definitely. and try and get that mentality back. For I don't feel like with NIL, it's, I feel like it's only going to get worse. Right. What do you think? Is NIL going to get to that? I mean, obviously we saw that. The I mean, high school kids are getting paid now, aren't they? Right. I high don't school know. kids are getting yeah. paid now. Is that yeah. official? <laughs> I think so. Softball had their yeah. first million, a uh, girl making a yeah. million dollars now in Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. That's she a big deal. She went to Texas Tech, and I think that that's, I mean, she, Nigeria was a pitcher at Stanford and then decided to go to transfer to Texas Tech. And everybody was like, why Texas Tech? Like, uh, you could have gone anywhere. You led your team to the World Series. You are one of the most dominant pitchers in college softball. And then we saw why. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think so many people have so many opinions on the transfer portal within softball. I don't know if it's crazy in baseball. Is it nuts? I don't know enough about the transfer portal, but I would imagine that it's pretty similar to softball. It's, and I mean, it's football's nuts, right? Football's nuts. Yeah. yeah. Football's nuts. Yeah. Softball, it's every year there's someone big that you wouldn't think was leaving, leaving. And so it's become a big hot topic within the softball world. And so, but when you see that in the opportunity, the as a professional softball player, she's not going to make a million dollars outside of college, right? right. And now yes. maybe potentially, right, yeah, in the future, hopefully. And hopefully brands begin to really back professional softball and we get to see maybe customized shoes and all these different things where women can make millions of dollars. But the opportunity to be the first, I mean, I think years ago it was Monica Abbott was like the first, there was headlines of her being the first softball player to make a million dollars. But, you know, being able to have that accomplishment I think is amazing. And I think more power to you, go for it. And that's something that she should do. But I also believe in like, if you don't feel comfortable in a space you're in, you should also be able to transfer and it shouldn't be frowned upon. Right. There's so many coaches that have ruined a game for athletes. Like I, you know what I mean? And when, if you just don't feel like where you are is your home, I think you should go find it. Now, of course, there's many people that leave because 
I think kids are just a little softer. Yeah, you can you say know, it. they're just, yeah. it's just yeah. different. But it's it's it's, it's different. Not their, it's not any fault. Of, it's it's not their fault. It's the way that we've raised them. Yeah. They've been raised that way, and they are used to being able to give a little less effort and get away with not not trying as hard. Uh, is is my opinion. That reminds me of this time. So there is this uh, there is this coach who got up it was like some kind of conference and he was talking about how soft this generation is and everyone all the other coaches are nodding their head they're like yeah they're not like us and not like how we used to be and he was creating this body of evidence to show how how much more tough the older their generation was when the, than this upcoming generation and he was like reeling everyone in they're like yeah 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 and then his next slide was it's our fault who raised this generation <laughs> and then it just goes silent and he goes Instead of pointing fingers at the kids, point a finger at the people who raised these kids mm -hmm. and I'm the one who raised this generation. I have three kids and I'm the one who tried to make it soft for them because it's yeah. hard for me and yeah. we need to change our mentality. And, and so it's really interesting how... But even yeah, like you said, yeah. you when you grew up, your Little League team, your team was your community. It was you my know? family. Like, yeah. So when a coach tells you something, there's yeah. no getting around that. You right. have to make a change, or right. I'm sure there's going to be you're not playing or whatever's going to happen. 100%. If a coach tells a kid something now, it's right. just like, all right, I'm going this weekend to a new yeah. team, new tournament. And a lot of the I'm time it's the parents' fault, guy. too. The parents are like, well, he's not going to start and play third and hit three in the lineup, then I'm going to go find a team where he can do that, rather than, yeah. okay, we'll stay Fair there for a couple position. of weeks and earn that spot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has yeah. coaching ever became an interest if uh, any opportunities came up on the college, collegiate level or – you still want to kind of play professionally, do TV, and or is that ever a thought in the future? Absolutely not. No. Yeah, no, I do not want to coach. Um, I absolutely love coaching young kids. Love it, love it, love it, love it. But once you get like to the tier when they get a little older and you know don't want to want to listen too much, yeah. you know, it's um it's a little more difficult. And but honestly, I just if I were to coach, I just thoroughly enjoy coaching kids like from the age group of like eight to 14 15 not to say I don't like coaching the older girls because I do but I just think that age is just so fun yeah and they're just so the personalities and being able to really connect I mean there's this one story when I used to give lessons like at LSU and this little girl her name was Jojo and she was a shy little thing that came to me for lessons and wouldn't really talk like our first couple. And then finally, like after our conversations and everything, she just burst and her personality just came out and she's the goofiest, loudest, just most fun little girl. And there was one day she came in and she was really quiet and she wasn't talking a lot. I'm asking her, I'm like, Jojo, what's wrong? What's going on? How was your day at school? And she's telling me about like these little girls that were bullying her and like she just didn't have a good day. And then I was, I'm just having the conversation with her and she's like, but I'm, it's okay. I'm happy it happened today. I'm like, well, why would it, why would you want it to happen at all? And she's like, cause I knew I'd get to see you after. Ugh. Mm. And then I literally was like, I was like, let me go excuse myself once I get in the bathroom. <laughs> but you know, I just think that the, and I'm not to say coaches don't have impacts on you later on in life, because I definitely have had coaches that have had impacts on me, Coach Trina being one of them at LSU. But I just think being able to do that at such a young age and to kind of like mold their confidence mm -hmm. and to really help them and uplift them to me is just super special. And so if I were to go into full-time coaching, which I don't think is something I want to do, but I do enjoy just coaching the young kids in general. That's that's where I think I would stick. Um, but have, have, yeah. Have you always been like that? Have you always been one who wants to have a positive impact on people? Is that something that you've, since you're younger, you've, you've always wanted to do? Yeah. I mean, I've always liked, I don't know why, I've always been just such a motivation buff like I love listening to motivational videos whenever I felt like I wasn't doing well or I was in a I don't like saying the word slump but whenever I was there I you know would always sit and listen to all these things to kind of help me get out or kind of reframe my mindset my dad is someone who would do a lot of motivational speaking which I think it, that's where it comes from essentially but he do a lot of motivational speaking and I would go to a lot of his events and I would listen to his cadence and how he would the messaging he would come across and the way that he would deliver it. And I feel like I've really gained a lot from watching him and kind of, um, it really, inter I internalized a lot of that. And so, you know, for me, I just remember the way that the crowd would react when he, you know, dropped the message. And it was just like, 
the way he just like captivated all these people and the way you could see it really impacting their lives, uh, I really wanted to do that. And so whenever I had the chance to, and I think in college was an opportunity where I, you know, really was able to do that a lot for a lot of the, the my teammates that I came across and then just like the girls that I coach. So yeah, it's always That's been, really cool. it's been fun. My dad told me when I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe 14, when like when you start to get recruited mm-hmm. and 14. Probably, yeah, that age. Just some. 14, 15. Lighter for others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even better, you know? Yeah. Like, it's never too late. Right, that's exactly. Like, that's a message in its own. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> but he told me, because that year he had put a cap on my um, back-to-school shopping. <laughs> so, like, the my budget was a little low that year, and I didn't like that. So I told him, like, listen, whatever money you're saving for college, let's just put that into this year's budget of back-to-school shopping, and I'll get a scholarship. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and his words to me was, AJ, if you're serious, he was very serious and just said, there's always someone better. So if you really think you're going to get a scholarship, there better be no one that works harder. And I don't know, that just transformed my brain chemistry in some capacity Mm. because it just, boom, from then on out was when my work ethic was born. And even when I would be in LSU, like laying down after a full days of work, even after extra hitting, like, man, someone in California has two more hours than me. Got to go back in cages. You know what I mean? Like it really just transformed everything. So yeah, I think I would I would definitely credit my dad for that. Now That's that I'm really talking about cool. it. Love that. <laughs> yeah. Back real quick on the youth side. When you work with kids, what are some of these big events that you get to go and get to coach kids up? And you mentioned softball needing some bigger brands to really step up and help. What are a brand or two that that has stepped up and help and is trying to push softball back into the right direction, which it, it is going. A lot of the big tournaments or the big events would be probably the tournaments. There's big ones out in California. I would say California, Florida, Texas, and Colorado are like the main areas in which girls go in the youth side, at least for travel ball. And then, but when it comes to just different events, it's just putting on different camps, right? The different camps that either I would put on or some of my former teammates would put on um, and really being able to to meet and greet and help them out. Um, but there's really no, there's nothing kind of set, right. essentially. It's really more so you finding or you creating it in these different spaces um, outside of the big tournaments. And when I think to brands that have really backed, I would think a lot of a lot of the baseball, softball brands have really kind of come to to back softball a lot more. I think of Easton as one of the ones. Easton has done, and Wilson, I feel, have done a really good job of putting the women softball players like in stores, right, with these photo shoots or like different gloves and different cleats, and being able to really have your own your own thing with them. And so I think they've done a really good job. I think companies like Ally are really starting trying to do more with women's sports. There's, I've put, it's so crazy because there's so many things that are just specifically for women that I feel like are lacking and that women could really, or women in sports, not just in softball, they would all benefit. And right now, women in sports are trending, right? It's, it's very trendy to want to be involved and to uplift and help women in sports. And so I really hope to see softball Scoot to the front of that list. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what is the, and this might be a personal question, but what is the fashion budget now? Because we were talking about your fashion game on MLB <laughs> Network. Tell me you're talking about it. And what are you was, saying about my like, fashion? We got to shout it out because <laughs> For sure. she knows what she's doing in the fashion game. So <laughs> yeah. we got to tip the old hat to you. But thank you, thank you. Thank yeah, you. is that I something it, you really enjoy all also? all goes back to that budget. Thank God I made that decision. You know? <laughs> it was back then it was like limited two, though. Thank God I had more. I could go to limited two and air apostle a little bit longer. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, as far as the budget, I definitely ball on a budget still. I'm a very good thrifter. I'm actually really good at finding a sale. Like I will never say no to a good sale. And <laughs> I, I don't think that. it doesn't matter how much money I make. If ever I do get that Shohei contract, I'm still gonna be at the <laughs> sale rack and Ross. Like it's still gonna happen. We'll and see. So, we'll see. No, I'm be like, I'll just take that. I mean, one. maybe I have like you know a Gucci here, Gucci there, but like my hat, my pants will probably be from Ross. But um, <laughs> I love but, that yeah. motion rack right here. <laughs> like Appreciate that. that. See, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, I, I mean, I just don't feel like. Money can't buy you style. It's just have it's your a core fact. pieces, and then everything else fills the fulfills the yeah, puzzle. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like a signature mm. piece and build around okay. it. Well, I mm. want to know how did you get into broadcasting? How did how did that happen? Yeah, that's a fun story. So I actually wanted to be a a sports agent majority of my life, and so my dad my dad's actually a judge. So I was like, okay, well I'm gonna go to law school, do that whole thing, 
And yeah, right, okay. casual. <laughs> but I don't really want to be a lawyer, so but I still yeah. want to be in sports. So I didn't have the choice. Sports thing. Yeah. Did you go to law school? No, I didn't have the choice to become. The, the mental capacity is not quite there. Oh, the fact okay. that you're like, I didn't want to be a lawyer. Right, right. I didn't want to go into medical school. <laughs> it was kind of set for me. <laughs> to do what? What did you do? Uh, baseball. And then sales, nice. talking. Nice. Get me I talking and we're fine. You hate sales? Yeah. Cold calling. Do not have me cold call anybody. I'll just start to get the sweats. But if I can develop a relationship, I'm yeah. In person, that. I think it would be different. Yeah. But like the call thing, oof. hate it. Oof. So my, I was going throughout. Everything was planned. I got my bachelor's degree in sports administration, and then I was planning to go to <laughs> you too. No, no. Oh. <laughs> everything you list, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was really it was not hard but except for accounting i had to take that a couple times <laughs> but then my senior year we had the sec tournament was at lsu and so like all of the span you know all the analysts come down to set up set up in baton rouge and they would always have me talk to different things so I was one of the leaders on the team it was my senior year and I remember after one of the interviews I had with them, one of the post game, Jessica Mendoza comes up to me and it's like, Hey, have you ever thought about a career in TV? And I was like, I mean, I do love it. I love being on TV, but no, I never really thought of a, a career in it. And she's like, no, I think you'd be really good. I think you should think about it. I was like, okay. So then I went and got my master's degree in mass communication and broadcast journalism. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> which is so interesting because when I really think back to it, I've always done things on camera. Like even when I would have school projects in elementary school, I always choose to do like a video for it. I had a show in college called My Way with AJ where I would compete against the different athletes. And it was just for fun, just because I enjoyed it. You know, but I, I don't know why my brain never thought to, well, let's make a career out of this. Um, and so then thankfully Jessica Mendoza, you know, just jogged that and helped me get through that. And so, yeah, after I got my degree, my master's degree, I my first, I did a lot of internships. So I interned with Uninterrupted and I interned with Players Tribune. And um, after those, I my first real TV was, or TV gig was with ESPN actually. I hosted a show called Unapologetic where I interviewed a lot of, I interviewed a bunch of black women in sports, athletes, and just about the different, the niche things that we experience that other women in sports or just really people in sports in general do not that are specific to black women, whether it be hair care, whether it be being viewed as too masculine, whether it be viewed as this and the third, right? Things that most or other demographics do not go through that we all share similarities for. And so that was very powerful. And I think that really set, you know, my path moving forward in, in journalism and in TV. And how did you get with MLB Network? MLB Network, I had a, a tryout in 2022, maybe, 2021. And then it just kind of all it happened. went from there, yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> a, a tryout, an audition. Is yeah. this is still sports. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah right, right, such right. a sports mind. Yeah. I had an audition. <laughs> yeah. How have you enjoyed your time at the network? Because everyone we talk to from the network seems to seem, or seems to say like it's like a family. Everyone enjoys working with each other. Um, have you gotten close with anybody at the network you work with a lot and you guys are always on the road covering stuff. So have you, how have you enjoyed your time there? It's been fun. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. I've, I've become really close friends with a lot of the girls. I know you had Sierra Santos on and that's one of my really close friends now. And so I think just being able to just talk to each other and talk the game, but it's more so to your point, we all genuinely like each other. So we'll go out and hang okay. out and yeah, it definitely helps, right? Like <laughs> to like who you work with. Um, but no, I, I, I love working at the network and I love the relationships I've built and the experiences I've had. What's what's the coolest experience? Because you've done some some pretty cool things. I mean, yeah. in baseball coolest. and away from baseball because we follow each other on Instagram and I saw for like three, four weeks you were, I don't know, was it Saudi Arabia. Yeah. I mean, you were all over the place. So yeah, Saudi was a fun trip. I love Saudi Arabia. Take us Arabia. on the ride of some cool. Was that a work trip or was it a personal trip? It was a work trip. Wow. But then I like scurried off and you know for a couple days. That was a work trip. It was a work trip. Yeah, oh, they we'll have like that. their version of Ad Week out there. <laughs> oh, sweet. and so I went and talked on a panel out there in Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, and it was so cool. Like you know, I just feel like in the States we're fed a lot of what the Middle East is like. Yeah. And it's, I don't know what I thought it was going to be, but 
it ex completely exceeded my expectations. And everyone there was so kind and so nice. And being able to learn so much about the culture and about the different people there, it was it was very eye opening. And that's I mean that's just the importance of traveling in general. Like mm -hmm. you you can you learn things that or you unlearn a lot of the things that you were taught to believe. And so. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And then I took a little side trip because I was to a place called Lula and it was beautiful. And I just did it because it was an hour flight and I've seen it on Instagram before <laughs> and it was always just saved in my place I wanted to go. So I was like, you know, I might as well just go. So I went by myself and, but it was, it was amazing. And I'd say that's so far, maybe it was just because of recent memory, but that's probably the coolest place I've been. And then, and for baseball, just coming back from Williamsport, that looked pretty cool. Yeah, cool Williamsport experience. is always so fun. Mm -hmm. It was always so fun. And then because the Yankees were there, it was insane oh, with like Judge walking up and the, everyone's just so excited. And I think it's so cool the opportunity for the guys to really so cool. kind of remember why you play the game, right? When you're watching these kids just go out and play. And I know everyone's wanted to play the Little League World Series. And there's been such a few, like a short amount of guys in the MLB that have actually gotten to play in the Little League World Series. So they're all like, this was always my dream. Yeah. Like, you know, and the little kids are like, well, you're my dream. Like what you're mm -hmm. doing is my dream. So it's really cool to see that economy of that. And um, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. That is a fun experience. Cool. I got to go when I got traded over to Boston. And it just feels like... It's like you said, everyone's amazed at everything. The kids are looking yeah. up to you like this. We're all looking at Williamsport, yeah. like amazed. I didn't get to check out the dorms. That was something I wanted to see because they said they had like the arcades, they had ping pong, they had all type of different, whatever what it was. What an experience for those kids, man. So oh. much fun. And then you get to go at the end and watch the big league game and it's all the little leaguers out there. And you know how it is like when you're in a grind of a season, it's every day can seem repetitive. And when you do something like that, it kind of just like slows everything down mm. and you just put a smile on your face and enjoy yeah. the game. It's yeah. not like, I need to get a hit. I need to get a hit. And right. It's a different perspective. I love it. I think that's what MLB has done a lot better of a job. And they're going to start playing games in Dominican. They're going to start playing games all over. So I enjoy that when baseball, you know, starts to kind of go outside the box and, and promote the game in different areas. I love it. You just sitting here and hearing your story, your your positivity is infectious and is contagious and all the amazing things you've done Yay. and are doing. <laughs> what we talk a lot about here on the on this podcast is is we, we've even said is your accomplishments and not just success is not just what you've achieved, but also the hard things you've overcome. What are some of those adversities that you've overcome that you can say has shaped the person you are today? Yeah, let's dig in deep. Mm. Welcome. <gasps> One of the hardest things was probably when I broke my hand. And it wasn't so much because, you know, it was painful to break your hand, because <laughs> obviously, but it was more so the battle I had internally and mentally after I broke my hand. I just did not feel like myself. I was, I was never, so I was never afraid to run into a wall. I was never afraid to, like, I would, break my neck to make a catch you know what i mean it just never occurred and just nothing stopped me and after i broke my hand for whatever reason like because maybe it was so painful to catch i just could not get to be myself again like making the diving catches or even like catching a ball became something that i feared and it was i couldn't understand what was happening because i couldn't stop it and i told you earlier about how like listen to all these motivational videos nothing was was circling back and it wasn't until, um, I don't remember when this was, we were playing the Pride though, and there was a ball was in right field and a ball came and I don't know what happened. I just like, something switched and I just, old AJ came back and I just like blacked out for a second. I don't even remember seeing the ball. I just remember hearing the bat or hitting, you know, hearing the ball hit and I ran towards the fence backwards and made a diving catch towards the fence. And that ended up being the catch that solidified me winning the gold glove. You know what I mean? And so it's like, I feel like that was the moment when I really understood like overcoming adversity and getting back to yourself and that it is possible because I've it, for the entire season. So for like a month and a half, two months, I could not shake. This mm. happened like the first or second game when I broke my hand. So I could not shake what I was thinking, what I was feeling. And then towards the end when I just did and it all just, I think it's just kind of like the power of 
understanding failure isn't the opposite of success or that it doesn't stop your success, but it really is a part of it. And like, you have to go through it. And whether that's failure of achievement or failure in reaching the mindset you want or failure in how you feel, you can get through it. And the only way actually for you to get over it is to go through it. I can't go around it because I was trying to find ways around it, trying to find ways to get back, whether it be listening to the podcast, listening to the motivation and reality, I had to, it's only one way. And, you know, I think I've learned so much from that experience and that's only enabled me to have that testimony to tell other individuals because baseball, softball, failure is inevitable, right? And, but it's, I guess it's the way you look at it that's really changed. So after that catch, it, it freed you up mentally. You were diving again, and yeah. it wasn't like a hesitation. You were yeah. just going going all out. AJ was back. We were back we were to back. Yeah. Gold Glove AJ <laughs> back, at that baby. point. First ever yeah. Gold Glove AJ. Yes. How yes. how real is that? So I don't know if we're, we would put that in the yips category, but when a guy gets the yips in baseball, and mm-hmm. literally you cannot throw the baseball from me to you, it's like it's a mental thing. It becomes a mental thing. How do you break out of that? Is that a situation where, like, I don't know, did AJ in that moment going back, did her mind get caught off guard so she just did it and there was no thinking involved? When a player comes to you and says, Sue, I I got the yips right now, where do you even begin? We can have an entire episode on this. So that was in a previous (laughs) podcast that I did it with another life. It was 10 episodes of interviewing the top neurosurgeons, baseball players, tennis players, writers. I talked to a writer. She had, she had the yips writing. She's like, I didn't even know how to hold a pencil. Oh God. She's like, I didn't know how to like, Whole, so she had to like, I had to learn with the other hand because I didn't know how to, how to write. And to your point, it, her identity was shocked, or was shocked. And she's like, I don't, who am I? Violinist couldn't hold the strings. And you're like, what are you doing? Just do it. He's like, I can't do it. But to your point, it's a, it's a crazy thing that happens in the brain that kind of holds you back. And what I've seen where there's two things that, and again, like some people like, don't say the word yips, but like two things that, that, that kind of take people to that is number one, when someone says I'm having struggles throwing, be guys who throw BP happens with coaches as well. Like even flips, even during flips, I've seen coaches. One bowl and all of a sudden it's like, two things, it could be multiple things, but here's the two things. The first question I ask is, do you get injured? Did you get injured in some way? Are you compensating? Because your brain wants to compensate, doesn't want to feel the pain of anything. Our brain does not, it wants to protect us. And so it's trying to say, no, AJ, no, don't do that because you might get hurt. And you literally have to tell your brain, no, I'm okay, I'm, I'm all right, but easier said than done. Mm. The second thing is, did you perform this in under high stakes and mistake and and mess up and embarrass yourself. Mm. And now your brain's like, "Uh uh-oh, I don't want to emotionally experience that again. And all the athletes that I talk to, they're like, it was one of those two things. And so the brain is so crazy. And and I kind of going along with that, did you guys ever experience when you got injured where you're like afraid to let it eat? The doctors doctors are like, no, you're good, you're good. You're like, "Mm, I don't know if I want to let it eat. Yeah, there's especially oblique injuries yeah. as a hitter. Yeah. I know you can speak on that. When you something happens and it's like that rotation and you really got to rotate as hard as you can, if anything in there when you do that kind of goes and you pull it or it pops or whatnot, when you're coming back on that way back, like I'm sure with your wrist, the first couple weeks back when you were playing, you still felt it. You know what I mean? You were still grinding, playing through stuff. So I always think it's that pulling the trigger, like really just letting it go because you remember that one time where that that pop or that feeling happened. So it would it would be it would definitely be a mental hurdle to get over because once you can finally go full throttle, it's like, OK, I'm good to go. I was really lucky with the injuries that I had. It was it was shoulder. It was elbow. It was you are fixed and now you can start to throw again. It was never, oh, I'll just try to get through this little bit of pain. It was always something so serious where I had to shut it down for a period yeah, of time yeah. and then build back up. So. Uh, I was never having to to have that tentative moment, but I had a catch partner. I'd, how do you explain this one? I had a catch partner that could not play catch with me from 30 to 90 feet. He would throw it as hard as he could, still couldn't play catch. We were playing fetch most of the time, but he would throw 96 to 100 <laughs> on the mound and dot every single time. Couldn't field his position, couldn't throw to a base, but the minute he got on the mound, 
he could throw it anywhere he wanted to. Yeah, we did an episode on on Lester. Could not not picking off that first base. Yeah, not be. It's 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 wild. And, and uh, yeah, he can throw a ball that can start here and cut around a plate. But yeah. like me to you, he just yeah. He was going through that. He couldn't do it. Yeah. Did you say a neurosurgeon gets yeah, the yips sometimes? We, we, no, a neurosurgeon no. is explaining the brain. <laughs> I hope not. Please no. Oh, no, thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, like, I'm I'm out. <laughs> I had to go with that. Okay. Oh. Okay. No, the right, your good. neurosurgeon good. was explaining what's happening in the brain. That's way better. They're talking about dystonia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I probably that's should have explained better. that part. Um, so uh, that's what a neurosurgeon yeah. does, just yeah. in case right. you didn't know. Right, Yeah. I mean, what were moments, though, for you, and especially in sports, that you really struggled mentally to come back from or to get over failure down years down years are always the hardest especially i feel in baseball like when you are watching the select group of people have x amount of chances and like maybe you're doing a great job but then you get optioned like you had a great game and the next thing you're optioned right or you're dfa and you have no idea what's happening and all these moves are i can't imagine being able to maintain that confidence all the time and even no matter how confident you are as a person like i think confidence is like a muscle right you have to work it out and when someone's literally just knocking you down every time you're trying to lift like it's hard to maintain it Mm -hmm. how in those circumstances do you? <laughs> I got lucky because I was playing with house money from the minute I got over here. So everything that I was doing at the time was just so wide eyed and bushy tailed at the start. And then I wanted to take advantage of what I had. And again, it was just, I got so lucky. I was never the Eric Hosmers of the team. I was the 24th, 25th, 26th guy majority of the time. I was that guy that got sent down all the time. And there was times where I got frustrated. But at the end of the day, I was getting paid to play a sport. And it may not have been the big, best level, but I was still getting paid to play the game that I loved and I was gonna give it all that I could until they ripped the jersey off me. So it was, every time I was able to come back from an injury or whatever it was, it was another step. And I think the biggest the biggest moment was in 15 when I was, I'd play a coach deal, all that rest of the stuff. And then Brian Snicker was able to call me from AAA and call me up to the big leagues when I basically thought my career was done. And then that sparked the Kansas City years and, yeah. and everything else. So that was, there's just, you've got to find a way to, to, like you said, punch through whatever it is. Don't go around it, just face it, deal with it, and move on from it. It's the best yeah. the best way to get through things. Every every player is going through something different too, whether it's you're a rookie and you're trying to prove that you should belong and stay there, whether it's a, a guy that's making money, real money, signed a big contract, you're trying to live up to that, whether you're trying to start in the rotation, go in the bullpen, like every player individually is going through something. When you are able to take that grind battle of 162 game season on with your teammates and you see that camaraderie in the locker room, I always think that's the easiest way to break out of anything because you guys are openly expressing your, your struggles, whatever you're going through. I can't, I don't know what I'm swinging at. I feel like I'm standing on my head in the batter's box right now. The ability to laugh with other people, get that off your chest. And then the next day, you know, you're going in there and it's like, all right, how's it feeling good? But three or four of my teammates are in a batting cage with me. And like, we're all figuring this out together. And certain times on losing teams, when it was kind of that we didn't have as much camaraderie, it was a lot of young guys that didn't really know what was going on or just trying to do their part and stick around. Everything felt internal and individualized. Like you're taking that 0 for 4 back to your locker and you're taking that struggle back home and not saying anything. You're like in your mirror trying to figure it out by yourself. And then all of a sudden, like the next day, you're like, all right, I'm going to the cage now. And oh man, the hitting coach knows I'm struggling. We haven't talked about it. Are we going to talk about it? There's so many little mental battles that go through. So if you can take that on with your teammates, I think that's the best way. And from coach to player, Players just want truth, especially from executive. If you're getting optioned after balling out and they're like, hey man, we we still love you, Pete, and we still believe in you. Yeah. Like, just go down to AAA, you'll be up in two weeks. You, how are you not frustrated? Yeah. But if you say, hey, listen, there's a business side of this and this kind of sucks and you're getting the short end of the stick right now, but we love what you're doing here. Don't change a thing, go down to AAA, stay ready. You're gonna be back up here and you're gonna help us win in the long run. So to me, that keeps the player a little more positive going back down if he should be up there and deserve it. But not all organizations communicate like that, and it's a battle. You, you remind me, so there's this phrase, the longer you hold on to it, the heavier it gets. And 
when you're going through very difficult times, we can internalize it and it gets heavy and heavy, especially at the highest level, you don't share it with people. And so a lot of times I would go to the veterans on the team and say, hey, if there's a young player who's going through something difficult, can I send them to you? Every vet, yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. And there'll, moment, there'll be moments where I'm sitting talking with a young player and he's like, man, I'm struggling. We're going through something hard. And, I'm, then, I, and then I'll say, hey, player, veteran, uh, Kluber, Glass, whoever, whatever, better. Hey, come sit with us. Hey, he, do you know he went through this as well? And the player's like, oh, you did? Hey, what did you? And then all of a sudden we're talking and then a veteran sharing he went through it and how he struggled and it's so neat. And sometimes I'm not even involved. Mm. There was one year where, uh, where Corey Kluber comes up to me and goes, we need to have players only chalk talks. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, players only. 30 minutes, optional, you can come in, we're gonna go into the cages, and he goes, Sua, just give us a topic and let's, let us teach ourselves. And so the topic of today, I'd go to the players, hey, what do you guys wanna talk about? Do I, hey, let's talk about being positive during negativity. And I'll say, all right, guys, what do you got? How do you, how do you stay positive during negativity? And it's a room full of players who have never, who, it's optional, and then they start sharing their ideas and their thoughts, and I'm just looking around, I'm like, this is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And 15 minutes turns into 20, turns into 45 minutes before a game, mm. before a game, and a group of players are sitting there. But what was really neat, the feedback that I got afterwards was, they loved hearing it from each other and it, like getting it off their chest. And like it was, it was really, it was really neat to, to, to hear that. But so to, to all of your point, there's something cathartic about sharing your vulnerabilities and being open and also hearing other people's stories as well. What are some characteristics in your experience that very successful athletes typically share, especially in the mental capacity? That's a really good question. The immediately, immediately my mind went to five characteristics. Number one just turned is on. they yeah. learn. So yeah. number one is it's essentially the growth mindset out of Stanford, Carol Dweck. Number one is they learn from failure. Like they, they learn, they take failure as an opportunity to learn as opposed to the fixed mindset person who when they fail, it's I'm a failure. It's, it defi it's an identity, not an event. Number two is obstacles. The successful athlete embraces obstacles. They want the hard thing. The fixed mindset athlete, they don't want the hard thing because the, the probability of failure is higher and I don't want anything to do with that. The, the growth mindset athlete success, they want the hard thing. Oh, we're facing a difficult, we have a, we have, it's hot outside, good. We're facing a difficult pitcher, good. Like, all right, that's part of it. Number three is effort level. The successful athlete gives their best regardless of how they feel. They might have 70% today, they're gonna focus on the 70% they do, do have, not the 30% they don't have. The fixed mindset athlete, they only give their best when things are going well. They walk into the clubhouse when things are going good, but when they're not going good, you can like read them from a mile away. They don't give their best. And also, another component to that is, is the fixed mindset person, when they see that they're not gonna hit their goals, they give up. This is that get person who's playing video games and they see they're not gonna win, they kind of like get out of the game or they, ah, I quit, I'm not gonna finish. The next two are, are really important. The next, uh, number four, one, two, three, number fourth one is they seek critical feedback. Yeah. They don't just embrace it, they want it. Like, help me get better. I was with the Cleveland, uh, I was with Cleveland Browns for years and the receiving core was doing drills. And the, one of the coaches kept giving them like positive affirmations. Good job. There you go. Great job. And one of the veteran receivers says, okay, are you going to coach us? Like give us some, <laughs> we're not doing everything perfect. Give us some critical feedback. And afterwards I talked to the receiver. He goes, he goes, I want to get better. If I, if I want to be told I'm great, I could just go to social media. I need someone with the right eye to tell me the little things that I'm doing better. And so the successful ones, they want critical feedback. When was the last time you went to a coach and said, what are my blind spots and how am I going to get better? Like we normally don't do that. And last but not least is a successful athlete. They, they learn from the success of others and they are inspired by them. They're not jealous and threatened by them. The fixed mindset person, like, oh, they're successful. Oh, it's because of this. They're, they're kind of curmudgeoned about it. The successful growth mindset athlete, they're studying their moves. They're looking at, okay, how can I adopt that to my game? Or how can I learn from that person if I can? If not, okay, but how, do I, how can I learn from them? So the five, the successful athlete, 
learn from failure, embrace obstacles, always give their best, seek critical feedback, and are inspired and learn from the success of others. Wow. I think maybe instead of the kids being soft, they're fixed. Right. Remember? We, like, it sounds, I mean, maybe it's like a nicer um, way to say, I don't know, we have a lot of fixed mindset athletes nowadays. Yes. To that point. Versus. So then I have coaches say, how do, and parents, how, now I'm getting fired up. Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. Me too, parents me too. say, I have them say, how do I help my child be more growth mindset? Right. A lot of it comes in how you praise your child. So for example, let's say your kid has a good game. Have a good game. The natural thing to do is, oh, you got three hits because you're a beast, because you're a monster. Oh, you <laughs> struck these, you had a good game uh, pitching because because you're my son or because you're my daughter, because that's just how we are. We're, we're, we're Hosmers, we dominate. <laughs> Hell so yeah. We, <laughs> I raised you, boy. He's like, oh, I actually do do that. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. So we think, so here's, here's the interesting thing about that. We think, we look at that, we're like, yeah, what's, what's wrong with that? Like, what's, what's wrong with that? Now, the problem with that is what you praise them on is something that they cannot control. I'm a beast. I'm a Hosmer. Yeah, a better right. way to do it is, so let's say the child, let's say the child has a good, a good day at the plates. The way to praise and to nudge in the growth mindset is, that's because of all the all the work that you're putting in at practice. Mm. That's because of the hours and the hours you're take doing in the garage, right. uh, working on your swing. That's because of the of your studying your swing or your learning for all the coaching that you're getting. And so uh, that's because you're resilient, because you're a good listener, because you're coachable. So then, when adversity strikes. They're going to focus Resort on their effort that. level, things that they can control, as opposed to if they have a bad day. Well, I guess I'm not a beast anymore. I guess I stra and all of a sudden, change my last name. No more hospital. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I gotta, yeah, I got you. <laughs> their effort level starts to drop, so you want to praise the process and not praise the outcomes, and that's something that you can nudge them that way. My biggest fault throughout my career was not accepting what I had just done, whether I'd given up a couple of runs, and looking for an excuse as to why it happened. Is that, would, was that a fixed mindset thing? Looking for excuses? Looking for an excuse as to why it happened, blaming somebody else instead of saying. Okay, so here's where it depends. Here's where, here's where it depends. At the end of the day, you wanna, it comes down to what helps you move on. I know some players, I've talked to some players, I will not say who they are, elite level Hall of Fame type players. After they would strike out, they would never put the blame on them. They'd be like, oh, the pitcher got lucky. Oh, I, 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 you, you got lucky to be able to maintain that confidence, to maintain that calm. So, so the other people are like, yeah, pitcher got lucky or you got lucky today. Kind of like, oh, I, I, I wasn't in the right place. But then the day after they'd go back to the cage as if everything was their fault. Okay. I got to clean this up. I got to clean this up. And so you got to like, sometimes you got to play tricks with your brain to right. find out. But if you're just completely discarding, just making excuses for everything, right. then yeah, then you're right. probably, you're just going, not going to get better. So going back to your five, number one, do you think people, like you even heard terms now, people say you win or you learn. So obviously instead of losing, you're learning. And every time you lose, you sit back, what happened? But do you feel like people learn from winning? You, you I, I think I've said, I think yeah. you know that. I mean, I, okay, no, so I definitely took yeah. that from no, you, no, but no, I no, wasn't no, sure no, if you no, wanted no, to answer no, it. No, yeah. what I'm saying is like, I've, I, that is my, my biggest pet peeve, a phrase I absolutely hate. And I, I, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. For that reason. You hate it. I hate it. The reason I hate it is because you're suggesting that you can't learn from winning. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, you learn from both. And a lot of times people, when they win, it's like, oh yeah, we won, we're supposed to win. Instead of stopping and saying, what, okay, wow, okay, I won, what can we learn from that? What happened, what, what were things that are outside of my control that contributed to the win? There, there were some things I could control mm. that contributed to the win. I, I think sometimes we'll just brush winning under the rug and just because just we feel good, the dopamine, we're feeling great as opposed to stopping and saying, because you always hear, oh, I lost. Okay, now let me go work harder and yeah. let me grind or let me look at, t look at the tape. But you could do that after you win as well. And I'm learning from some of the greats are like they want to learn from winning as well. Kobe has a great quote about that. I learn, learn from both. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You learn from both winning and losing. And so that's, yeah, I, I think Preparation. that's. So there is a player. So there's a player who's really hard on himself. Really, I was about really, to ask you that. I am yeah. excruciatingly so, hard on okay, myself. So there's a player who's really hard on himself. And we came up with this, with this 
this framework at the end of a game. And so we, he was so hard on himself. So he would go and throw, he would go six, he was a pitcher, go six innings, give up one run. And all he would think about is the one run he gave up. That was all he'd think about. And he would just harp on him so mad, so much to where it deflated his confidence. You just get so, get so frustrated. And I believe where your, where your focus goes, your energy flows. And he was so focused on the bad that it negated all of the good he was doing. And then he never was able to build on it. So we build this framework. At the end of every game, he answered three questions. Number one, what did I do well? Like, number one. That question was so hard for him to answer. He's in his mid thirties and he's like, Sua, I cannot answer that. It, that is so difficult. I was like, give me something. And he's like, I, I look good in my uniform. I was like, okay, good. And he's like, That's oh, wait, that mine. counts? My like, eyebrows look good today. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so <laughs> then it got to the point where your brain, when you ask yourself a question, your brain's going to scan looking for the answer. And so, and so he just got comfortable and used to what did, what went well today? What went well today? What went well today? And if your brain knows you're going to ask that question, it's going to start looking for the good. And he would literally come up to me before the game starts. He goes, I already have my good for the day. I'm like, you haven't even played yet. The game has even started he goes but i already got like five and he st his brain started to change the second question is what did i learn today we didn't say what did i fail at today because he was always so hard we just changed the language what did i learn today from the wins from the successes from other people from himself and then the third one is what am i going to do better tomorrow so the theme for all three was essentially help him be more positive help him be a, a learning machine and help him always feel like he's in control. And he would just, every night, every night, we would answer that question every single day. And it was really cool. One day we were walking back to, the, we're in a parking lot after a game. It was me, him, his wife, and they're pushing the stroller with their kid. And, uh, and his wife, she goes, Justin, I, I know about the questions. I was like, oh, that's awesome. And she goes, he'll probably won't want me saying this, but he's like, it's affected him as a husband and a father as well. And he's oh, teaching our son the same thing. I'm like, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And like, to your point, like you just never know what aspect of the life it's going to, it's going to affect. And there'll be a moment he'll text me to this day. He's like, I had a conversation with you today, meaning that he's still using the questions uh, yeah, when, to this day. But when yeah, you do something, when you do something like that and talk to somebody like yourself and, and do that and you have success doing it in sports, you for sure take that process home yeah. and you're like, oh, this worked here. I can, yeah, I can take that here. Yeah. What yeah, was so. things that you both did as far as your process to get out of, again, slump? I hate that word, but the way that it affects your mental, the way that you're trying to figure out, you know, if when you're talking about trying to find the good, it's like, golly, I really want a whole lot of good. I struck out three mm -hmm. times. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, how do you, or how have you been able to overcome those situations? Just go get drunk. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> 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 At least for the night, right? Yeah, you bring it for the day. Go on for the night. Oh, man. Write that down, kids. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> if you're a husband, that's what yeah, you do. Right. <laughs> you know what? You know what's so funny is you learn so much from when you're a younger player to an older player. So. Mm -hmm. First of all, the frustrating days were the days, not all the time when I went over four, it was if I started second guessing myself, if I didn't stick to what my approach was or my plan, if I went up there and said, all right, I'm on the fastball, I'm on the fastball, and all of a sudden I'm like, ah, I don't know. That's when I really got frustrated with myself, when I didn't fully execute my plan. And the times where I was going through it and I wasn't performing well, when I was younger, I wanted to get there early and get on a field, get on a machine, 100 swings, boom, boom, boom. Towards the end of my career, I realized, okay, maybe I need to do less that day. Maybe I'm just going to show up and I'm just going to get five swings on deck and go up there and see what I got. And I think sometimes that freed me up mentally because at the professional level, I think when you're playing so many games, you think it's something with your mechanics. You think it's something that's yeah, going on. So you do more. Yeah. And I think more, most of the time more. mentally, I think we lock ourselves up as athletes. So I've learned, I've, I've definitely learned a lot. A lot of the times my struggles were based on injuries and, and not feeling 100%. And I think um, I just... It's hard. It's so hard. It's coming so back, hard coming back. And then you put so much work surgery. in to get back that once you're... When you're back back, it's like you want to maintain it, obviously. And, and it's it's just... I was so old by the time I came over here, as no. he likes to point out all the time. So <laughs> you were like 26 max. 27 I was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now... Uh, so, yeah, it's a... I had such a short memory, which helped being a reliever. And, and, Did you develop that at a young age? 
I actually, Roger McDowell was the one that was, he, he was my first pitching coach and I was so, I came over here, I was so raw and he was just like, look, take a breath and just calm it down. You have to forget about it because you're going to have 80 of these a year and you're going to fail in 15 of them. So figure it out. And I, I didn't learn how to do that until he, he told me something like that and take mm. things back down to 80%, like certain things that I was trying to lift to the level that I was at. And he's like, no, 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 no. You're here for a reason. We've got to get you to where you're calm enough and then you can build it back up. The battles, I mean, outside of just sport that mentally athletes would go and have conversations with women versus men and how different those conversations look or how different the the mental struggles that they have in regards to sport that also had lead into the outside life or outside life had lead in due to women have more so a microscope on them because not only do you have to perform well to maybe have the brands but you also have to be cute right your hair has to be done you can't be to this or to that you can't be less this or less that and it's it's more than just performing it's also an image you have to keep up and it, I feel like that can add a lot more pressure as a woman in sport and I don't know if anyone has you've had those different conversations or how women have overcame those how how do you do it honestly it was it's hard I was in the body issue right and so being the ESPN body issue it's essentially like my nudes on the internet, right? So like, it's like, but it's obviously done in a very tactful and you get to see the way women athletes, well, all athletes, right? Are in the beauty of our muscles and the beauty of what it is and the power of who we are and how it is we're so successful at whatever sport anyone's competing in. And, you know, for me, for a really long time, I had been very insecure about my muscles. Like I had, I didn't want to show them off. I would wear clothes that didn't, I didn't want to lift too heavy, which is, I think, a consensus that a lot of women go through, especially in softball, especially because we're more dominant on one hand to wear a lot, right arm, your left arm is bigger than the other. And then, you know, so it was the struggle I had for a really long time. And it wasn't really until the I got to college when I kind of made up my mind. And I think that all stemmed from one person making a comment on, oh, you look manly, right? Like in a, a shirt I had or something, because I have, I've always been a very cut person, always had muscles. And so from that one comment, like, everything about my self-perception had changed and the way that I was dressing and the way that I viewed myself. Didn't want to be too manly, didn't want to work out too much. And it wasn't until the body issue when I was like, or college when I was like, man, AJ, do you want to be an All-American or do you want to live your life off of this one comment that this one person made that may not even be at the level you're at today? And that switched my mindset to when I lifted heavy, ran faster, all the things. And the body issue was another opportunity to really appreciate myself and my body and the hard work and have a visual of oh wow no that is beautiful like I worked for that that body is what got me to college that body is what made me an all-american that body is what won me a gold glove but it was a process you know what I mean and it was a long one I mean I that comment probably was made to me when I was in middle school so 12 or 13 and that didn't go away till I was 19. It's, you know what I mean? I mean? It's, still, so, it's still on your mind. You use yeah. It as and it wasn't fully, completely eradicated until I was in the body issue and really seeing myself. And that was when I was, I don't know, 23, 24. You know what I mean? So a decade, essentially, to where I was fully like appreciate, appreciating myself. And I'm just curious as to how other women have maybe gone through that and be able to do it in a shorter time than yeah, a that decade. You, <laughs> what I heard you just describe is there were no prescriptions but cha to, to change, but it was a perspective change. And I have worked with like elite CrossFit athletes, LPGA uh, women, um, just uh, some softball players and uh, WNBA athletes. And essentially it's, it's not, and I've, I've said this a lot of times, I'm not the answer person. It's not all these answers. At the yeah. end of the day, it's, it's creating these generative conversations where someone feels safe to think out loud. And so it would essentially be, okay, AJ, like, like let's hear like, what do you think about yourself? And then all of a sudden you put it on the table and I'd pick it up and then it's like, okay, let's take a look at that. Like, you, did you, you thought that? And I've had a lot of athletes say, I didn't even know I believed that. That's crazy that I just said that out loud. That's what I believe. And then it's like, okay, 
first, you can't change what you're not aware of. That's the first thing. And so we just, hey, let's create some, a space of safety and vulnerability. What are your thoughts about this? And, uh, and it, where, where you know it's not going to be, someone's not going to go and share with the world, but place where you feel safe to share. And then how can you change the way you view it? It's that common phrase, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so the, the physicality didn't change, but your perspective changed on it. And I love that you said it's, and sometimes it'll still pop in. Sometimes like you'll yeah. get these like little, like, like the, there's little darts that pop in your mind, but it's that awareness. Am I aware of where my attention's going? The example that I love to give is, is I'll, I'll talk to a lot of athletes. They're like, help me stop my negative thinking or these, these unproductive thoughts. It's like, we're human. You're always going to have them. And so the analogy I love is, you know, when you're driving on the highway and you have um, the rumble strips on the side that vibrate the car. And so you're going, if you lose focus or start dozing up and then you got it, all it does, it's a gentle way to say, wake up, like wake up. I love to write down a list of mental rumble strips with athletes and just say, okay, what are all of your negative thoughts? All of them. Let's put them all down. And you would say like, whatever it is. And you don't have to share them with me. You're not sharing with anybody. So they're writing all these thoughts down. The ones that you don't have to generate them because they're always on your mind. And then, and so then we say, whenever you have these thoughts, those are your mental rumble strips. They don't signal that you're mentally weak. They don't signal that you're a bad person. It's a signal that you're losing focus and you're getting off track. And so then you create an anchor. Then we're like, okay, where do we, because focus isn't just something you have, it's something you do. And so now we need to, once you notice, oh, I'm starting to think these thoughts, where do I want to direct my focus? And then you have the person say, I want to focus on my breath or it could be a scripture. It could be a motivational quote or it could be whatever you want it to be. But okay, once I hit my rumble strip, now I, boom, that's a signal. I needed to redirect my thoughts. Rumble strip, redirect my thoughts. And so they get much better at rebounding and, uh, and navigating it. But that's one way to help people gain better perspective. It's not for athletes either. That's for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. life advice so. right there. It's crazy how the mind is a muscle and you really do have to stay on top of it. You have to. What do you always say? It's, it's lifestyle. a lifestyle. You always, yeah. Yeah, you always say. You said mind is a, mi- a lifestyle? It's like, so the mind is a muscle. It's like physical, like you want to stay in shape, you have to work out. It's the same thing, in my opinion, with the mind. It's like, in order to, when something, when that thought comes, in order to take that head on, you have to kind of train your mind for when it comes instead of shying away from it. That's my, it, just and forget about it. Yeah, when I started, talking with Sua towards the end of my career. It was before my last season and he was with the team, I was with the team. So we didn't really get to talk about it every single day. And I wish I could have because after that fact, I was telling Justin, I'm like, this is a lifestyle. This isn't something that I can just hope that's gonna change after doing a couple of different exercises or breathing a couple of times, or this is something I gotta continue to change and add it into my routine every day. And that's kind of, what I came up with, and that was the feedback I was giving Sua. It's almost like breaking down a swing and rebuilding it. It's uh, mm-hmm. you have to you have to t- put the time in. I'm absolutely, yeah, because I got my mind like you said. It would it would think of, it would just go right to the negative stuff. Like this is a great conversation, and I'm gonna be like, all right, AJ is not on American Ninja Warrior. Well, that, and she yes. doesn't speak. Spanish. Yes, yes. <laughs> could, could you, on both. Oh, yes. Man. But but you, AJ, we all say this plenty of times, and we truly mean this. And players around the league say this: you're a superstar, AJ. You really are. Aww. On and off the field. Nice. Nice. So Thank you. Good luck with everything in softball. Continuing to promote the game. You've already done an amazing job promoting baseball, and especially with the youth. So. We're locked in. We're going to be following you. Can't wait to see what's next. This is awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks, y'all.